Thank you very much. So let me join the other speakers in thanking the organizers for organizing this great conference and inviting me to speak. I think I feel like a rather a topical outlier in this conference, so I rather ambitiously decided to give you a very broad brush overview of a, sort of a whole program that I have been working on in the last couple of years. Um, we'll see how I do about time. Um, and the uh, pivotal result that I'll sort of uh, try to uh, describe and uh, wrap the talk around is in, in this paper right here. And these were done with various sets of collaborators, but out of all these excellent collaborators, I want to highlight uh, Max Rota, who, I mean, this, this program that I'll be telling you about is really his brainchild, and so he has been the driver of this whole set of projects. Okay, so um, the motivation um, goes back to um, quantum gravity, understanding the emergence of space-time, and we have this nice uh, context where we have a description of uh, space-time in a non-gravitational language, Okay, so the hope is to utilize that. And in particular, I'll retreat all the way to classical regime where we have toolkit, uh, where we can sort of understand uh, particular features of that uh, regime. And then the idea is to bootstrap away from that once we understand how things work in this uh, corner of parameter space where I have um, an, infinite le an infinite lambda, sort of fully classical bulk uh, geometry. Okay, so uh, an expectation growing over the last decade has been that in some sense, space-time uh, emerges from entanglement or is, is held, is built up from entanglement. So in trying to understand what that means, uh, I want to understand what is the entanglement structure of uh, holographic uh, CF states in a holographic CFT that uh, are describing a classical bulk geometry. So I'll call these geometric states. And, um, okay, this phrase entanglement structure is pretty vague. What I will do uh, is focus on describing the entanglement entropy for, uh, uh, in the CFT, for partitions of the full Hilbert space that are particularly natural in this context, in particular described by spatial uh, subdivisions. And a collection of all such entropies for such subsystems are described in a space of entropies uh, and this region that's relevant is called the holographic entropy cone. That, that's the word in the, the phrase in the title of, of my talk. And in particular in describing what is this collection, I'll be describing the boundary of this object which is delimited by relations between subsystem entropies uh, which we usually call the holographic entropy inequalities. Now, you can uh, make arbitrary number of sub subdivisions of the space on which the CFT lives. So I can consider arbitrary number of subsystems. And this will be sort of the novelty in the mindset of not trying to stick to uh, explicit small n where we can actually uh, see various things explicitly, but rather trying to understand the structure relations between different values of this number of subsystems and sort of bootstrap from low n to, you know, arbitrary n. Um, okay, so um, I should, I should again caution you, this n is really number of subsystems, not the rank of the gauge group, which is infinite. Okay, so brief review, as you probably all know, entanglement entropy, uh, is defined as the von Neumann entropy of the reduced density matrix when you tra trace out the complement of the given system. So here we're uh, defining the subsystems by spatial separation. For example, subsystem A is some spatial region of the space on which the CFT lives and so forth. And you can, we will consider uh, pure states that where we specify all these regions, there's always a purifier that's the complement of the union of all of these, and the state on that is uh, going to be a pure state. And uh, the collection of all such possible composite subsystem entropies uh, 
these are all independent uh, objects, uh, can be collected into what we call the entropy vector in a space which is exponential in the number of these subpartitions. Okay, so d-dimensional uh, vector space where this object called entropy vector lives, and we will be trying to characterize what is the uh, collection of all such uh, viable entropy vectors that describe a geometric state in holography. So in the holographic context, we know how to calculate entanglement entropies using, for, for in this classical regime that's given very simply by an area of a bulk uh, extremal surface, which is homologous to the given boundary region. And in particular, if you have multitude of such surfaces, extremal surfaces, then you pick the one with the least area. And in fact, this property in the prescription is crucial in the development of sort of characterization of this entropy cone. The, the fact that you're, you have you know, multiple families as exchange dominance, and uh, in, in, in some sense, we will be able to abstract away uh, in computing the boundary of this entropy cone, abstract away just the feature of whether the uh, extremal surface that's globally minimal for, say, a composite region AB is given by uh, the union of the extremal surfaces that are individually extremal for the A and for the B parts, that compute the entanglement entropy for A and B individually, or if there's a new surface, that combinatorial or, or, or just discrete bit of information will be all that is needed. Okay, so all the details of what these extremal surfaces look like are going to be immaterial. It's just going to be this, this sort of very coarse uh, set of questions of are the composite uh, entropies given by things that are already obtainable from the subsystems. Okay, now um, not all entropy vectors are allowed. They have physical restrictions on them. The ones that are universal are very well known. We have things like subadditivity, which is the statement that the uh, total amount of correlation, which is captured by this mutual information, cannot be negative. Uh, the strong subadditivity uh, says that the conditional mutual information is, is positive, meaning the mutual information is monotonic in uh, subsystem size. So the amount of correlation between A and B, C must be at least as large as the amount of correlation uh, between A and just B. Okay. Um, now, there are many more. So this was when I had picked any two subsystems. Here is when I pick any three subsystems, you know, in arbitrary state, um, this, you know, in, in, in that, that, that's physical. And you expect if you pick more subsystems, you have more such relations. And of course, all of them have to be symmetric under changing what the naming of these subsystems is. So that's permutation symmetric in these labels, A, B, C, and so forth. It's also purification symmetric. Okay, this is a novelty compared to if you just had a classical system, that wouldn't be the case, or you wouldn't have a nice notion of this purifier. For our systems, we have this purification symmetry where the entanglement entropy of some system is the same as the entanglement entropy of its complement. And so you can, there's other versions of these inequalities that are obtained by this purification. So for example, you get this arache leap inequality from the subadditivity by, by, by purification and so forth. Okay, so we'll, we'll take the whole set of inequalities that are obtained by this permutations and purifications in a you know, single symmetry orbit. Okay, and now how do we characterize, how do we sort of uh, think of the structure in some convenient way. The further restrictions depending on the type of system we take, and we're going to try to understand the full set of these things in holography. Okay, so geometrically, in terms of the structure of the entropy space, a collection of all such entropy vectors forms a convex cone in the entropy space. And in fact, uh, the, the, for the cones that we will be interested in, uh, it's a polyhedral cone, meaning it has finite, it's a, it's, it's, it's cross-section is a polyhedron. And such a, 
uh, such a cone can be described in two very convenient ways that are in some sense complementary to each other. And in fact, it's computationally hard to pass between one prescription to the other. Um, which is, one is in terms of these extreme rays. So the cone is a convex hull of these extreme rays. These are one-dimensional structures. And uh, another description is in terms of the cone's facets, which is really as intersection of all these half spaces uh, that, that delimit the cone. So these facets will correspond to these uh, entropy inequalities. In the holographic context, this is the holographic entropy cone, and these uh, holographic entropy inequalities are the things that uh, these people have, uh, well, coined the word holographic entropy cone and, and explored the structure for up to five uh, partitions. Okay. Now, there are other cones that are convenient to define in this entropy space, apart from this holographic entropy cone. Um, so if you, I mean, let's fix the number of subpartitions for the moment. The holographic entropy cone is the set of all holographically realizable entropy vectors. It's polyhedral. It's some, some region in this entropy space. Again, it's a cartoon of the cross-section. The set of all quantum states is, of course, much larger. It contains all the holographic ones, but there's... Uh, many more, and it's not even known whether that one is polyhedral. It might not be polyhedral, but it's certainly a convex cone that includes the holographic one. Now, I told you that uh, subadditivity is a restriction on any quantum states, but there are strong subadditivity and many other restrictions. So if you have a cone that's just delimited by subadditivity inequalities between all sorts of subsystems, then that cone is what I'll call the subadditivity cone, the SAC, that obeys this nice nesting. That one is also a polyhedral cone. Okay, and it will turn out that it's very useful to sort of try to think of the holographic entropy cone in terms of this um, subadditivity cone. And there are many other sort of nested objects that you can define. For example, if you edit the restrictions of to the subadditivities, also that it satisfies strong subadditivity, then there would be some other polyhedral cone that would be, you know, between these two. Or if you said, let's take only the extreme rays of the subadditivity cone that are compatible with holographic states, that would be convex hull of the subset of these extreme rays that are, uh, that are holographic, that convex hull would be a subset of this holographic entropy cone. Now, the question of whether these are proper subsets or really can coincide is a very interesting one, because if they can coincide, we have nailed down something that might a priori have been a difficult object to compute into something that's very easily characterizable. So the name of the game is to try to explore this structure in some um, uh, efficient way. Yeah. It has to be convex because you can superpose states. It doesn't have to be polyhedral. We don't know if there's finitely many for each n, whether there's finitely many inequalities that restrict it, or in fact, infinite family of them, or if, you know, if they're all linear and stuff. But it has to be convex just by, because you can take superposition. Okay. Good. Okay, so for n equal to two, if you just specify two subsystems, that such a coarse-grained description, you know, entanglement entropies themselves are fine-grained, are sensitive to microscopic details, but, but you're just collecting a very discrete set of numbers that are sensitive to these fine-grained details. So if, if, if you only have two such subsystems, then all of these cones, in fact, coincide, and they're what we saw in the last slide. They're just given by the subadditivities, and that's it. Uh, but if you have more subsystems, then they are strictly nested. And here's an example for three subsystems. Uh, the subadditivity cone is just delimited by the various permutations of subadditivities. The uh, quantum entropy cone also has to satisfy the strong subadditivities, but in fact, nothing else, or n equal to three. The holographic entropy cone, uh, in fact, well, it lies inside this. The subadditivities become redundant because there's a stronger inequality known as the monogamy of mutual information, MMI, which 
I have written down here, so these are the two that we have seen before. This is the new one, MMI. Structurally, it's pretty similar. You can think of it as, well, it's a negativity of the tripartite information, and it's a statement that if you have a correlation between, let's say, A and B, C, it has to be at least as large as the individual correlations between A and B and A and C. So correlations can't be shared, entanglement can be shared for A and uh, B and C. Okay, that's the monogamy. Okay, but that's not very important. The, 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 the important statement is, well, this inequality does not have to be satisfied by generic quantum states, but it does have to be satisfied in holography. And so, in fact, the subadditivity is redundant. You can see that if you take the sum of this one and this one, you get this one. Okay, so you don't need to have this. This is not an independent inequality anymore. Now, for larger uh, n, the quantum entropy cone is already unknown. It's only known up to n equal to 3, but the holographic one is known fully up to n equal to 5. For n equal to 4, the only things that you have is subadditivity and uh, MMI. For n equal to 5, there's actually two versions of MMI, depending on the size of the subsystems, and five further inequalities. Um, so that, that sort of eight orbits of these facets, which give you under this permutations and purifications quite a, quite a few facets, 372 facets, and you know, over 2,000 extreme rays organized in some 19 orbits. For n equal to 6, we don't have the full cone, but we already know that there are at least 182 orbits of facets and over 4,000 orbits of extreme light rays. So this thing goes very fast. It has intricate structure, and frankly, it's quite a mess. So the question is, well, where did all that come from? It's something that's delimiting a pretty important construct geometric states. Now, what is it? it? It's telling us something, but how do we extract what it's telling us? When you say that it proves to be the complete set, that means that there exist geometries that lie anywhere inside the Um There's certain, yes. But uh, it's, well, there exist geometries that lie anywhere inside this cone in a bit of a cheating way. Um, you can take disconnected manifolds and then by construction, it's, in, in, it's convex. If I point at a particular spot in the entropy cone, there isn't a nice procedure, algorithmic way of con constructing for you the specific geometry a priori, well, at least a nice geometry, but I think you can construct a, you know, you know, one of these horrendous multi-boundary wormholes and sort of design it that way. There's a nice way of getting the extreme rays, and you, and, and again, if you take just a, because everything is in conical hull of the extreme rays, you can say, well, take this extreme ray plus some other extreme ray, and again, compose it out of these disconnected geometries. But, but, but then there isn't a nice way geometrically of just patching that up into a single connected geometry. And it's certainly not clear how to achieve that with a single boundary, a priori. Great. Any other questions? Okay, so I told you there are these two ways of describing the cone that are convenient. One is in terms of the facets and one is in terms of the extreme rays. So the facet description, um, if you want to go on, well, we haven't, so there's a little, little bit further that we have got, but I am only going to show you one slide on this. One observation is a bit easier to, instead of dealing with, you know, entropies, Directly, it's more convenient to deal with you know, mutual information, tripartite information, in general, all these multipartite informations. And if they have arguments that are not composite, this, the collection of all of them form a basis. And so in this I basis, the expression for the uh, sign definite quantities is slightly nicer than in the entropy basis. This is sort of a shorthand of the entropy of the subsystem or the you know, five-partite information between A, B, C, and so forth. Um, but it turns out that it's even more convenient to take tripartite informations with composite arguments, and that tends to simplify things. Okay, we don't really understand why it tends to simplify things so much, but empirically that seems to be very nice. So, for example, this, this expression, which is the same as this expression, can be compactified into just two terms, 
One is a tripartite information and one is conditional tripartite information. Okay, so it, it's, it's a useful packaging because it allows you to generate higher N inequalities and, and, and so forth. And the hope was to sort of try to extract what's the meaning of it. But we don't really know what's the meaning. It's not yet simple enough. What we do know is that these sign definite objects are not correlation measures because they cannot be monotonic under, um, you know, under inclusion. Okay, so that's, that's in a work that's, 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 uh, uh, currently in, in, in preparation. Okay, let me turn the page and talk about the extreme rays, which is what I want to really focus on. Um, so those are the special states, um, and uh, they, they must simultaneously saturate, you know, in D dimensions, D minus one of these uh, entropy inequalities, so that they can be one dimensional, one dimensional states. So in, in holographic context, they're typically these multi-boundary, specific multi-boundary wormholes. And studying these, well, there are two useful toolkits that allow us to extract the essence uh, of, of what we have. One is uh, re rewriting things in terms of a graph model, and one is abstracting the entanglement structure in a, what's called the pattern of marginal independence. So roughly speaking, this one distills, sort of discretizes the information in the space-time to collect just D numbers. And this one actually goes from the vector in, uh, from, from D real numbers into just a Boolean, larger dimensional Boolean structure uh, where, we're, where we're extracting just the sort of what, what, what will effectively be focusing on the boundary of this entropy cone. Okay, so I'll, I want to very quickly sort of indicate what, what these things are about. So as a sort of background, uh, detour, the holographic graph models associate, so those were already uh, utilized in this original paper, they associate vertices to regions in the space-time, uh, which are partitioned, which are bounded by pieces of these uh, um, RT surfaces, of the, of the minimal surfaces, or really more generally extremal surfaces, and uh, the edges in the graph are pieces of these are these surfaces with a weight given by that uh, corresponding area. So if you have, say, two regions like this, you have a vertex for each of these regions. The vertices that, the regions that are adjoining the boundary are called boundary vertices and they're labeled by the corresponding region. Uh, here you don't have anything else, but here if you have a composite entropy of AB that's given by this arch of a minimal surface, then you would have an extra vertex that corresponds to the region that's inside this arch, but outside of these domes and so forth. Okay, so these graphs then with weighted edges allow us to compute the entanglement entropy by computing a min cut of the, of the, of the graph. And in fact, a graph like this can, uh, you know, you can, you can, you can capture a situation where this surface dominates or where the collection of these two surfaces dominates by uh, by having that corresponding min cut due to the weights being through different parts of the graph. Okay, so this sort of structure is useful in now dealing with just discrete objects. Of course, if you sort of try to do explicit graphs for explicit configurations, it's a mess. So here there's only four regions, but they're pairwise correlated, so the corresponding graph, you know, how many intersections of these regions in the bulk you would have, well, you have 43 such regions um, and, you know, many parts, 88 parts of the various e extremal surfaces between them. So we're never going to focus on, 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 on specific graphs, but rather the whole collection of them. And as already these guys showed, the graph cone is identical to the holographic entropy cone. And so we can now just work with graphs instead of working with geometries. Essentially, they have argued that, well, for every graph you can construct some geometry, and of course for every geometry explicitly, I've just shown you how to construct a graph. Okay, so the extreme rays are not as bad as what you have seen on the previous slide. So these are the original renditions of the extremal case in the, for the five, for the ni equal to five case. Here, you can actually rewrite the graphs in three graphs, which, which is sort of, 
uh, operationally much nicer. And uh, we will utilize this structure in, or rather, the result that I'll show you utilize this structure somewhat heavily. Now, as an aside, I'm, I'll just very briefly mention that this graph technique was only, well, is very useful, but was believed to be only applicable in the static situation where you have the real Takayanagi prescription and everything takes place on a single spatial slice. Um, in fact, it turns out by reformulating recent reformulations of the holographic entanglement entropy that are fully covariant, well, uh, you, you can, instead of extremal surface, it has already ban, been done a long time ago uh, to recast this as a maximization, as a maximum prescription. You're maximizing in a time-like direction, minimizing in a spatial direction. Uh, you can reverse that order, and doing so allows one to construct a graph for arbitrary time-evolving uh, bulk geometry. So all the toolkit actually applies in full generality, you don't have to restrict to just the static uh, case, which is quite nice. So this is something that we're writing up uh, with this course, this also should come out soon. Okay, so I promised there are two, two, two bits of toolkits. The other one was this pattern of marginal independence. This is now a specification of which mutual informations vanish and which don't. I don't want to ask how big they are, what is the number, but rather, is it positive or is it zero? And so that's, uh, that's where we get this Boolean structure from. The, the name here is the marginals are the, are the reduced density matrices and they're independent if, if the structure factorizes, if the mutual information vanishes, that's why, hence the name. And holographically, you can think of vanishing mutual information as simply this entanglement wedge being decorrelated. Uh, they being disconnected, whereas if mutual information is positive, the entanglement which is connected. Uh, every entropy vector has a unique such specification. And uh, it, geometrically in the entropy space, they correspond to some linear subspaces uh, with the dimensionality given by how many independent sets of these simultaneously vanish. They're intersections. Each, each single mutual information vanishing is a hyperplane uh, linear subspace of the entropy space that's uh, of uh, one co-dimension one. If you have multiple sets of these, then, then the dimensionality of the space is smaller and smaller until you get to extreme rays where that, where the PMI is just one dimension. Okay. So, uh, we want to, we want to, um, understand the structure of these PMIs to build up to description of this holographic entropy cone. Okay. So what we have shown by utilizing the graph model and, and this PMI, what we have shown in this paper is that uh, basically if you assume, well, if you assume that all these extreme rays can be rendered as three graphs, or actually even make a weaker assumption, then every extreme ray of the holographic entropy cone for some number of subsystems N can be obtained uh, from extreme rays of the sub additivity code, a much more primal and simpler structure, but for some finer partition. Okay. Um, so the cartoon of that is based on how many subsystems you have. Initially, at n equal to 2, all the cones coincide. For n equal to 3, the sub additivity cone is larger, but the convex hull of the extreme rays that are holographic is still the holographic one. But eventually, you get some extreme rays of the holographic cone that are not extreme rays of the sub-additivity cone. And what you have to do is take a sub-additivity cone in a larger N and project it down by sort of coarse graining, by combining two subsystems and thinking of them as a single one, uh, to get the extreme ray. And it, the, the, the number that you have to go, of subpartitions you have to go to, uh, is specified by n. There's some bound that's, that, that, that you can get to. So if you go to the highest possible n that's, that's in this bound, you can get all the extreme rays from various projections of the sub additivity cone. So that's sort of the cartoon of what's happening with this theorem. And so that in principle, in principle allows us to reconstruct the full holographic entropy cone. Uh, but 
in practice, it's complicated because we need to, well, we need to know what are the, which extreme race to project. That, that, that will be a crucial part that I'll come back to momentarily. We want to then take the convex hull. We want to extract the extreme race and construct these facets. Okay, so that's a computationally hard problem, but in terms of specifying where the whole thing is coming from, it's one way of sort of describing it. So in some sense, it sort of demystifies what's, uh, where the holographic entropy cone comes from. And so the crux now is to say, is to figure out what is the set of these extreme rays that one is instructed to coarse grain. Well, it's the ones that are, that are holographic, that are, that are obtainable by some graph model. But how do we characterize them? So we'll try to characterize them in terms of this pattern of marginal independence. Okay, I'm running out of time, so let me try to speed up and just take a few more minutes. Um, so not all such patterns of marginal independence are possible. Uh, some are just mathematically inconsistent. Some are physically inconsistent. Uh, the ones that are sort of mathematically inconsistent are would violate some identity like this. So this is uh, just an identity coming from permutation symmetry of tripartite information. So if you had, say, three of these being zero and the fourth one being non-zero, well, that would just, just doesn't make any sense. Um, or you can have physical inconsistency. Well, suppose two of these are zero on one side. Well, then sub-additivity says that these are non-negative. And so if sum of two non-negative things is zero, then they both have to be zero. Uh, or you can have something more sophisticated, like SSA would imply that if this is zero, then this uh, thing would be zero. In fact, in the later paper, this is a crucial, well, this implication is what we call the Klein condition, and we used it as an approximation to strong subadditivity to, uh, and that seems to be very powerful. Okay, so in the, um, okay, let me, let me skip this, and let me just sort of tell you how we're sort of, what we're utilizing in this. So instead of trying to describe the extreme race of the subadditivity cone, we know the facets. Those are just the vanishing of mutual information. So that's very simple. And we want to then think of the D minus one collections of independent set of these that then specify for us the extreme race. So we want to consider the families of these mutual informations, meaning the set that vanishes, to specify this extreme race. And the question is, how do we handle them? What, what are the, what is the toolkit that we can use? So the convenient toolkit for, uh, for sort of implementing this mathematical consistency is, is a metroid theory, which is something that sort of abstractifies the notion of linear dependence in this sort of combinatorial language. And if you, there's a oriented metroid version of this that allows us to very nicely implement consistency with subadditivity. And then the, you can implement this sort of inclusion property, this Klein condition that I just talked about, by thinking of a poset of these mutual informations where the order is given by inclusion. And in fact, it turns out that this is a much stronger uh, structure than just a poset. It's in fact a lattice. And so you can use mileage from lattice theory to, uh, to, to sort of explore the structure. All right, so for n equal to two, you know, poset of these diff six possible mutual information looks like this with the poset ordering. The matroid has a nice structure that in matroid language is called a whirl, uh, where, you know, each of these segments corresponds to one of these planes that we had seen in, in this picture. So for higher n, you can actually, it turns out convenient to organize the set of all these mutual informations into a complex, that's a geometrical structure where you have uh, uh, some, some, some uh, simplex with uh, all, the, all its faces being included. So we call it this W complex for worlds. So for n equal to three, well, each, each world would correspond to a triangle uh, where, the edges, where the vertices are labeled, labeling the entropies, the edges are labeling the mutual information between the entropies, and this is the collection of these worlds. So when you have n equal to three, you have six worlds with 18 edges and seven vertices, which are the entropies. For larger n, you have, of course, many more of these worlds. So you can sort of think of them of 
We can generate them by these generating edges and construct this full W complex. Here I, for n equal to five, I haven't drawn it, but because it looks like a mess. But structurally, this is sort of all you need to sort of characterize the set of these objects. Now, within that set, you want to extract the structure of the relevant set that then you project down to get this holographic one. And so the structure turns out to be nice to sort of, uh, as an organizational principle. All right, so for example, the extreme rays are, are a collection of at least D minus one independent, but at least D minus one such structures. Um, uh, okay, let me not spend time on this. Um, but just to illustrate the power of these restrictions, if you count how many elements are consistent with this Klein condition, with this, this, this inclusion under monotonicity under inclusion condition, then uh, the number of elements is much smaller than you might have a priori that are just consistent with, uh, with the linear dependence. So, so for example, here we have seen you have uh, 18 of these, of these edges of the triangles, but you have only six of them that are holographically realizable. These are the mutual informations between the single parties, like I of A and B, rather than composite ones, because those could never be realizable facets of the entropicon. Similarly, at n equal to four, you probably can't read this, but what you can probably see is that the KC lattice is much smaller numbers than the, than the ones that are, don't have this restriction. So we're bootstrapping our way up from implementing one constraint, narrowing down what the structure is, and then seeing compatibility with another constraint which narrows it down further and so forth. So we're still in the process of building all this up and sort of characterizing the various sets of these extreme rays of the subadditive eticone and uh, seeing their nesting. I think since I'm uh, really running out of time, let me just uh, not delve into the details. Let me just say that uh, it, it turns out that the, the objects that are sort of um, easy to extract from the structure might miraculously end up being the relevant one for actually reconstructing the holographic entropy cone. We don't, we don't know that that's true, but we have some hints at lower end that, that does seem to be true. Seems kind of, kind of miraculous, but it's a, it's a structure that, that at least there's a lot of um, area there to explore and to verify whether this is true or not. Okay, so let me summarize. The main point in terms of the physics was that the holographic entropic cone can be reconstructed from this much more primal, simpler structure, which is just the subadditivity cone, which is just the statement that amount of correlation cannot be negative. That's all. It doesn't know about holography at all, and yet, uh, well, it knows about holography in this so that it has to be holographically realizable. And also it knows, it, it utilizes finer partitioning. Okay, so, um, so we have simplified the problem. Uh, if you know the whole collection for every n of the, for, for, of, of this, of this marginal independence problem, of which of these patterns of marginal independence are realizable, then you automatically can recover this in principle is holographic entropy cone. Whereas if you worked at fixed n, there might be a lot of sort of contamination from the, just the numerology. So this is one lesson of sort of, let's not try to understand these, say, these holographic entropy inequalities at a specific n. That's not really what the physics cares about deeply. It, it, there's lots of accidental things happening at specific n, but the full collection at all n, uh, knowing the structure of that, that's sort of much deeper. And there was this puzzling, seemingly minimal dependence of, on holography, but really what, what we have been using is, well, this arbitrarily refined possibility of, well, possibility of arbitrarily refined partition, but also this, the fact that we had these phase transitions, the fact that we had the RT or HRT formula. Okay, so that, that's all really that went in to this constructing of this holographic entropy call. Okay, so I'm out of time, let me just, and here, and thank you for that. Thank you very much. Questions?
So this conjecture about everything being representable as a tree graph was pretty important. Can you comment on what that means about the quantum state or the physical interpretation? Does that tell us something about holographic quantum states that there's some crucial fact that they could be represented by these tree graphs? Well, um, let me go back to the picture of the n equal to 5 case. Okay, this is the n equal to 5 case. You see that, so this graph is as the same entropy vector as this graph. So it's not that it has to, well, so this graph, I mean, you, you can always construct a graph that's not a tree graph that has the same entropy vector. Um, the, and it, I should say it's not, that, that conjecture is not as, uh, it's stronger than what we need, so you don't really need it. The, the operational advantage of it was that we, this, this, we can relay this PMI uh, to a subspace that corresponds to this uh, the so-called Minkat subspace. Um, but in terms of what it tells us about the, well, the, the specialness of, of the extreme rays, whether or not I represent them by trees or not, is the fact that they have maximum Minkat degeneracy. So it's like you're at the at these phase transitions where multiple RT surfaces have the same area for the same region. You have to have maximal sets of these in order to have a extreme ray. Okay, that's the special thing. And then is this conjecture saying that the extreme rays are realized by simple wormholes? Yes, that's except the... that it's multi-boundary wormholes where this the number of these boundaries can be quite a bit larger than the original n. Thank you. Well, and, and then the topology of the space-time in between is simple. You don't have any any handles, any any any, any analog of I mean, non-simply connected um, parts of the the wormhole. Imagine we have not a, not a GR, but effective field theory in the bulk. Thus, being inside the entropy cone put some interesting constraints on the holographic effective field theories. Good, that's a very nice question. Um, um, it's, I, I wouldn't, ex well, not without additional provisos, because of course you can take a completely non-holographic quantum state that's inside the holographic entropy cone just by. But, yeah, imagine you just, uh, you take something like you know, Gauss-Bonnet theory, we know by itself it violates causality. Could it be that it violates some of this inequalities? Maybe people looked at it. Well, it's more like if you find something that's outside of the holographic yeah, exactly. cone, then, then it definitely violates something. Exactly. If so you find it inside, it doesn't mean anything. Exactly. So are there, can you, by imposing that something is inside, derive some constraints on effective field theories? Oh, oh sorry. Um, so we don't know. Um, we don't know. I mean, it's also an interesting question whether you can relate, for example, this holographic entropy. For example, y utilize the connectivity of entanglement wedges by sort of trying to play these signaling type games, a la uh -huh. uh, May Source and uh, company. Um, I mean, it's very tantalizing to think that maybe you can. My philosophy is that, of course, the time is much more important than we're giving it credit that somehow, even though we have formulated in the RT case everything at a given instant in time, there are hints coming from the, from sort of causality and stuff like that, but we haven't extracted that. But I think it's a useful direction to think about. So um, is there any of these inequalities where if we saturate it, that implies something nice about the holographic state or something nice about the bulk geometry that we can derive from the saturation? Well, it lies on the facet of the holographic entropy cone. Um, now, it's not, I don't think you can derive anything um, 
nice about the state because it depends on the, it also depends on what your specification of subsystems is. For example, you can saturate any mutual information being zero simply by taking separated regions. Okay, and then the RT surfaces for the composite thing are the individual RT surfaces and okay, it doesn't really mean anything, it just meant that you separated the regions so that those subsystems are decorrelated. Um, but, but again, it's, so it's more saying that, well, if you keep separating them further, then from that standpoint of that inequality, nothing further changes. You have transition to a different family of, 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 uh, of these extremal surfaces, namely the ones that are disconnected and then the, um, you know, then you're in, in, in that family. So um, you could try to, say, fix the specification of the subsystems and then vary the state. Um, but I think it always translates to basically, it, it translates to, well, you have decorrelated something. Yeah, um, can you actually say, in a, for example, for the five-party cyclic inequality, when it's saturated, what is being decorrelated? Oh, very good. Sorry, uh, I, I should. Okay, so I gave you a very trivial example, which was pertaining to the subadditivity cone, and for subadditivity cone, that was all there was to it. For the holographic entropy cone, indeed, uh, these higher uh, holographic entropic inequalities, um, yeah, are more interesting. We don't know what the physical interpretation of saturation is. That was the whole motivation for trying to understand how to write them more compactly. So. In this more compact way of writing them, you can relate different, you know, sets of terms to each other. And the hope is that maybe one can extract a narrative for what that saturation means. And, and, and sort of similar as for, for the answer, uh, for, for the previous discussion, you might even hope that you could sort of try to operationally describe it in terms of some, let's say, some signaling or something, you know, with a time-dependent actual process or something like that. I mean, that's a wild hope, um, but but we don't have any negative for saturating these these higher higher end ones. Okay, so in your time, let's thank uh, Veronica again. <laughs>